This is where things can get contentious and people want to fight you over their technique and what they swear by doing. What's up Lazy Dog fam? Hope all y'all are having an awesome day. It is Saturday, March 30th here in South Georgia and today we're going to get some tomato plants in the ground. So we're going to be planting some determinate tomatoes, a few indeterminate tomatoes, show you how we do both of those. And I'm also going to tell you why you probably don't need to add any extra calcium when you plant your tomatoes. So these aren't the best looking tomato plants I've ever grown. A lot of that has to do with the fact that we had so many fig trees in the greenhouse and we're scared to over fertilize them. So these didn't get quite the nutrients that they need. I think they'll be fine though. They'll turn the corner once we get them in the ground. Did, within the last few days, have a few of those GMO purple tomatoes start to pop. So that's good to see. And as far as those purple tomato seeds go, that company may have the purple part figured out, but they've got a long way to go in the vigor department. Got a lot of work to do as far as getting some seeds that can really show some vigor and get up and going. Anyway, so on a video earlier this week, we talked a little bit about tomato plant size and how that sometimes can be deceiving, how you can go to the big box store, find a smaller plant for five bucks, find a huge plant for 20 bucks, and how people often fall for that illusion and go for the bigger plant thinking they're gonna get more tomatoes. Now there are some that live in climates with a very short warm season and they claim that they need to plant bigger plants because they just don't have enough warm days to put a smaller plant in the ground and wait on it. But I would argue, from my experiences at least, a bigger plant has a lot more transplant shock and oftentimes this one catches up to it pretty quick so I haven't found that plant size matters that much down here because the transplant shock with this one is usually a lot more than it is with this one so this is where we're going to be putting our in-ground tomatoes this year we will be planting some in the raised beds on a later date this is our oldest no-till plot. I've actually never planted tomatoes in here, so I'm really excited to see how they do. Came in here yesterday, went ahead and set up my drip system, went ahead and laid two drip lines. I have those running right now, getting that soil nice and moisturized before we plant. So as you saw there, we're gonna be planting two rows of tomatoes today, one row of determinants, one row of indeterminates. I told y'all a while back that I'm not planting near as many determinants this year because I don't really need to can any tomatoes this year. We've got plenty in the pantry. Those determinants are my home run hitters, the ones I really rely on for canning. So only one row of determinants this year as opposed to the two rows that we normally grow. And you also may have noticed I've got those rows pretty far apart, say five or six foot. And a lot of that has to do with this camera I'm standing in front of right now. If I stack my tomato rows too close together, it's hard to get in there and film and really show the entire plant. Since I have some extra room, I like to spread out my tomato rows a little bit. Makes it easier to show you guys kind of the differences between all the varieties. If we were in a survival situation, needing to grow as many tomatoes as possible from these little little 30 by 35 plots we would stack them in there a lot tighter so the first row is going to get determinants we'll split it into thirds plant a third red snapper a third roadster and a third of that bhn 871 gold and then the second row here is going to get an assortment of different indeterminate varieties that we grew out in the greenhouse and although I know many people love it and swear by it, I'm ditching that conduit drop string trellis for my indeterminates this year. I'm going back to the cages, just going to let them bush out, just going to enjoy the few tomatoes I get off of them before the heat gets them in July. Now I may still use that conduit set up for some cucumbers because it did work really well for my cucumbers last year, but not going to be using it on tomatoes. And we've got some absolutely beautiful soil to work with here. Very high in organic matter. This plot had several inches of that gin trash compost sitting on top of it for quite a few years. And then we added a couple inches of that wood chip compost several weeks ago. Looking really, really good. And as far as tomato planting tips go, most people know that you want to plant these things deep. If you didn't know that already, now you do. Uh, how deep do you plant them though? I've seen people go really overboard with this. They'll have a taller, say indeterminate transplant, maybe twice this size, and they'll dig a foot hole down in the ground and plant that rascal really, really deep. 
Now I did try that a few years ago with some taller indeterminate transplants I had. I couldn't tell it really made a huge difference, but some people swear by it, so you may want to try it with at least one or two transplants. We do heal our tomatoes just like we heal our potatoes. We'll mound soil up around those plants, and we'll show you how we do that once these things start taking off in their new soil. So because we're going to heal them anyways, and because I don't really think it's necessary to put them a foot deep in the ground, we're not going to go overboard with our planting depth. I'll probably plant this little guy about right there, and this one here probably about right there. I'm not going to bury it all the way to the top. So most people will agree that you need to plant tomato plants relatively deep, but then we have this whole idea of needing to add calcium when you put your tomato plants in the ground and all these different types of calcium that you can add. This is where things can get contentious and people want to fight you over their technique and what they swear by doing. So the premise here is that tomatoes are susceptible to blossom end rot. There's little black rotten spots on the bottom of your tomatoes. If you haven't seen those yet, you probably haven't been gardening long enough. And that is caused by calcium deficiency. Now it's important to note here that the calcium deficiency that causes blossom end rot is a deficiency within the plant not within your soil. You could have boatloads of calcium in your soil. You could add all the calcium you want and you can still get blossom end rot. And there's a number of reasons why the tomato plant might not be able to access or uptake that store of calcium that you have in your soil. Could be stress, could be lack of soil moisture, could be infrequent watering, could be competition with other ions. There's a whole plethora of things that could cause that plant to not be able to access that calcium. And as I mentioned earlier, if you grow tomatoes long enough, you're gonna have a little blossom end rot. I seem to always get some on those first few tomatoes and the plants kind of grow out of it. So I don't necessarily panic if I see a few of the early tomatoes with some blossom end rot. Now, if you perennially have bad blossom end rot issues every year, you probably wanna start out with a soil test to see if you have calcium in your soil or not. Most of us have plenty enough calcium in our soil. That's why I say don't go chasing this calcium deficiency in your soil. Do a soil test first, make sure you've got enough calcium, and then you can kind of, you know, figure out what else might be the problem. And another thing to consider is that most of your all-purpose kind of relatively balanced fertilizers out there have calcium in them. So like this Coop Grow fertilizer that we'll be using today has 3% calcium. So I don't really feel like I need to add any extra calcium because it's in here. We use this with pretty much everything we plant. So check your fertilizer bag because you already may be adding enough calcium if you put down a pre-plant fertilizer like we do. And lastly, as many of you know, I'm not a soil scientist. I'm just a backyard gardener, but I can share my experiences with you. I used to have blossom end rot a lot worse when I was using the blue stuff. When we switched over to using only organic fertilizers, I don't get it near as bad. Can't really tell you why that is. If I had to guess, I would say it was something to do with some ion competition in the soil, but I can't really say that with 99% confidence. I can just tell you I don't have near as much of it as I did when I was using synthetic stuff. So that may be another thing you want to try. If you're using a lot of synthetics, if you're getting a lot of blossom end rot, maybe back off the synthetic stuff, do a little more organic and see if it gets better. All right, let's do some planting. So the drip tape we're using has a six inch emitter spacing, which is probably a little overkill for tomatoes, but I like this emitter spacing because it means I don't have to run my drip as long to keep these tomatoes happy when it does start getting hot around here. So I'm putting out more water, don't have to run as long, and keep all my plots happy. With these determinants here with our three different varieties, I'm just going to plant these in alphabetical order. So BHN first, then Red Snapper, and then Roadster. So let's get us a nice looking plug out of here. We got more than we need, so we're going to cherry pick the good looking ones and I think we'll start right there I want to give room to put my t-post for my Florida weave trellis over here so I'm not going to start right at the beginning of the row but we'll start probably about right here sprinkle a handful of that coop grow into the soil there and then just put this little baby 
in the ground not too deep but deeper than we plant peppers or cabbage or something like that and for these determinants where we'll be using the Florida weave to trellis these we want to put these on a two foot spacing we want the plants to be able to kind of lean on each other a little bit so we just need to skip three emitters and then right there is where our next plant needs to go so just a little coop grow down there get us a plug out of here and we'll just keep trucking along till we get the entire row planted all right so we got our determinants in the ground and just the way it worked out with the spacing we ended up with five bhn gold five red snapper and only four roadster down there on the end that's very important to remember in case one of these plants doesn't make it we've got plenty of backups over there but we need to know what variety to replace it with and just a little tip for those of you that are going to be using the florida weave trellis and are using drip tape leave it uncovered leave it exposed between the plants for now until you drive your stakes that way you can see the tape you won't have to worry about poking a t-post through it so we use a two foot spacing on those determinants because we want them to kind of lean on each other inside that florida weave trellis for our indeterminates we're going to spread those out just a little bit these cages i use are kind of wide so i'm going to go with a three foot spacing on my indeterminates and I've got more than just three indeterminate varieties to plant, so alphabetical order isn't gonna be as reliable on them. Went ahead and made me some labels using these field stakes that we've had on our website for a while. We've had the white ones, but I'm out of stock on the white ones. Just got some colors in though. We've got them in red, yellow, and blue now. So I went ahead and set my plants and labels out there three foot apart. And so the only thing different here is the fact that we have a three foot plant spacing and we're using plant labels. So same thing, put a little coop grow in the hole, get our transplant down there, get it covered up a little over halfway there, should be good. We don't want to poke this through our tape, so we'll put our label right there and we'll do the rest. And just to kind of give you an idea of what we got going on here variety wise we've got three of these turkey creek plants this is a variety that mike from kentucky i believe sent me several years ago really good tasting indeterminate tomato then right here we've got wisconsin number one and wisconsin number two david from wisconsin has been sending us his tomato seeds for a couple years number two was supposed to be his latest improvement number one was pretty good last year but we'll see how those compare then we got one of my favorite indeterminates right here which is called rose we've got this ox heart variety of viewers sent us and then the last two down here are cherokee carbon which i've never tried but i'm excited to see how they do so that first row the determinants is the one we can count on for consistent production the varieties we know are going to be reliable year after year that second row is kind of the fun row if we get a few tomatoes off some of those plants we'll be tickled about it if some of those plants croak no big deal we've got plenty in the other row so i hope you enjoyed the video today and remember check to see if your soil has enough calcium before you go wasting eggs or tums or adding pelleted calcium to the soil when planting your tomatoes you might already have enough there and the reason you're getting blossom in rot is because of something else not because you don't have enough calcium and as always you can find seeds for those determinate varieties we planted today along with these colorful field stakes on our website at lazydogfarm.com and if you've never tried the florida weave trellis but want to know how it works watch this video right here we'll break it down where to put the t-post how to run the string all that so check that out and we'll see you next time right here at lazy dog farm